Hello, I'm Frank Jessup, Capillary Wood Turners. Uh, we're going to do a three inch uh, bevel edge uh, uh, mirror uh, today. And, uh, you know, I, I teach this, uh, I teach it at beginner level. It lends itself very well to production run. Here's a group I did yesterday to refresh me for this. Uh, these are fairly plain woods, but uh, that wood is from River Farm, and that's where the mirrors are going. Uh, I have all the props here for my process of doing this, and by the way, there's probably another thousand ways of doing it. It's, this is just the way I do it. Uh, so let's walk through the props, and then we'll make a mirror. Uh, and after the props, I've got tools here. Uh, I've got essentially seven steps here, and I've got props for them. Uh, first, you want a blank, and to make your blank, what I've done is I've got a piece of cardboard uh, and I start by laying out the blank for band sewing with the uh, uh, a awl and then after I've got the center point from the awl I use that center point to lay out a circle this circle is about two and a quarter and that gives you a quarter to three eighths of an inch both sides fit still to fit in a uh, tie on uh, chuck with number two jaws which is what I'll be using. So that is uh, step one. Uh, step two, I turn a tenon on the back uh, to that line and uh, then I'm ready to, this will become the back, I hold it from there to work the front the front does not have a center point, uh, so I, what I'll do is just bring the uh, live center up and uh, put a little pressure on it, and I've got a center point that's true because I'm holding it on the back. And then I lay out a circle that's three inches, and the purpose of that circle is that's mirror size, and then I can take these uh, jigs I got three different types here, triangular, square, uh, blocky, but they're all the size of a mirror. And I can use them for fitting the hole. And these are also all true on the face because I use double sticky tape to hold my mirrors in. So I can use this at an angle to confirm the face is flat uh, when I'm through fitting. I will still go to the mirror for absolute final fitting, but this is to get me close. And I can hold it on here to see how true my line is. And as you can see here, I would be safe to take the entire line out because the line is inside of three inches. Uh, I like precision equipment. Here's what I'm currently making my lines with, and this old uh, compass is so worn out that I've got to use vice grips to keep it set in one location. So I've got the center point, I've got my line, take out the line, stay as flat as I can, and then fit it till the mirror will go in. Then I've got my fitting, the mirror will fit, uh, still holding in the same place. I finish the front because I can't get back here. Uh, I've also, this uh, video will go up on the CAW website, on there is my article on how to make these, and here's where I differ. Uh, you can make these by expanding the jaws, and of course none of us would ever ex over expand those jaws and crack one or something, but I once had a student do that. So I've since uh, made up a block, uh, just plow with it, to go in the uh, chuck, tenon on the back. And I use one piece, not two, of double sticky tape, only an inch or two long, uh, to hold the mirror on. Because uh, when you're through, you need to get the mirror off. So even though that don't center, I will bring it up with the live center here. So I'm a little better off with it small and not having any fit problems. Besides, I made this one too small, I don't want to make another one. Uh, Finish the front because I can't get back there. 
turn it around and since that tape at that point will only be on there a minute or two and it's pressure sensitive tape, uh, I bring the live center up uh, back into the original hole on the back and do as much turning as I can uh, to the back before I remove the live center. So I would come down to this nub left and uh, I just want this to be a pleasant curve with no uh, flat spots uh, because if that's laying on the counter, here's a finished one, uh, a lady with uh, arthritis or my wife has trigger finger or whatever can pick it up, uh, no problem. Uh, the younger ladies probably don't, uh, they might enjoy one of these, but they probably don't even use makeup. So. Uh, I'm, I'm making them for the older ladies to be able to pick up. Besides, they're easiest to sand that way. Then that is removed and friction polish it. I will show you that when we're actually doing the video. And here's a finished one. I put the mirror on double sticky tape, two strips. And uh, you know, as always, these people even using liquid nails, uh, the double sticky tape I never got mess that squeezes out or anything. I do have the complication of flattening the back, but I've had no returns uh, to have to tape again, so I'm calling it adequate. Now there's other modifications you can do. This is, this is just standard. Here's a, a jig that Don Riggs developed. And if you can see on camera, there is uh, three lines on this. A uh, little post that's behind the plate. There's three lines here. Uh, these two lines are where the jaws meet, and if you'll notice, uh, the jaws are numbered on the tile on. We have numbers three and four here, so I know how to put it together or how to put it in the chuck. The chuck four jaws <laughs> grab it here, oop, there. Uh, with one on each side at these lines, this line and this line, and uh, the uh, you do all your normal shaping to make it round uh, with with that, and then you can offset to this additional line here. That's three eighths of an inch. And that's the only offset I've ever used. That's one of the lines there. You could use anything. And then I've turned this mirror in this area here and left a little bubble shape. If this were jewelry, I would turn that out to it becomes a hole. And what I did is uh, I drew two lines on here and the uh, burning there is just blobs by sticking the burner down. I also, while it was offset, drew this line uh, and that's just a spear tip to sort of, uh, I, I was thinking, uh, make it look like water across there or some kind of vine. But anyway, it dresses it up. Probably wasn't necessary, but it is another way of doing it. So you can do them offset if you like, uh, or just on center. Mostly I make them on center because I give everything away and it's quicker. If you do off center, this is a plane and this is a plane and you will have to do something usually by hand to take care of the ridge that will be developed here uh, but it is the innovation you can add to your stuff uh, now uh, let me do tools and then we'll go make one uh, I always have too many tools on the lathe that gives me an opportunity to drop them on their tip but I've got two scrapers here this one is a just a standard Sorby one inch uh, scraper and as you can see I put the uh, drop uh, nose uh, profile on it uh, that's currently popular. I think when I wear this off I'll quit using it. But the neat thing about a squared across scraper I can not only flatten in the uh, behind the mirror face to get that area flat but if you're cutting on a curve and you don't dig into points uh, with a straight across scraper and you're cutting the entire distance. I don't understand the math or the theory, but you can't help but fare a, a, a curve. You'll have no flat spots if you're cutting all the way. Uh, this is a one-incher. 
Here's one I use a lot that's made from planar iron, and as you can see, same profile on both ends, which gives me both profiles. If you do use planar iron, it's high speed steel. Uh, if you're lucky, you get it for next to nothing. Uh, but take this edge off, or you're asking for trouble. I have here a homemade uh, quarter inch uh, parting tool that is honed on the end. You see the shiny area on the end. And uh, I can use that to, to start uh, fitting the mirror. Uh, I can uh, also f uh, fire a curve with it and what have you, but I have the scrapers here. Uh, this is a homemade tool. Of your basic sears uh, diamond tip uh, scraper here or uh, parting tool which I, I probably use the most. By the way if you've got one of these diamond shaped tools make sure your point is centered on the diamond or you lose the benefit of having a uh, tool of this type. I've got a, a half inch bowl gouge here and uh, you know, everybody's playing with profiles these days. This is mine. If you were at this angle, oh, how to do this? Uh, if you were at this angle, I'm looking at the TV and I'm trying to do everything backwards. Uh, if you're at this angle here, uh, across the top of your cutting surface, and came here, mine would be a circle. I call it a safety uh, grind because uh, I've been accused of being aggressive uh, when I'm doing bowls and this controls my depth. I can only cut as deep as I pull the uh, sides back. This is a worn out uh, 3 8 inch spindle gouge and uh, I like those. I've got a handle to put it in. Uh, else it wouldn't fit in the sharpening jigs. So I put a flat on the top here so I can fit it in a, a sharpening jig. Uh, they're more rigid as they uh, are close to worn out. I've got two that's shorter than this and if you're hollowing boxes or something uh, that reduces your vibration. I've got a half inch spindle gouge. As to say these are probably more tools than necessary. That's been sharpened into a detailer with the back relaxed a bit. Uh, this is a regular, I like the one way best, but it happens the one I got in my hand here is just a regular half inch that I knocked out of the handle and uh, sharpened up as a detailer. Uh, C.A. Savoy came up with this grind. And I've got just your basic skew here, a small one in case I want to trim the uh, face of the hole as I'm making it larger uh, for mirror fit. I probably won't use this because I will have the 3 8 inch spindle gouge in my hands and I can use it just as well, so I probably will. Uh, now let's go make a mirror. Okay, okay we've got a, a piece mounted with Wait the... Okay. We've got a piece mounted with center point as I had uh, indicated and we've put the uh, live center in that point. We have the line here that's roughly two and a quarter inches which gives us leeway to fit in the chuck. Uh, and you can cut this two ways. You can plunge a parting tool in near the line, uh, just as a starter and then take it away with the gouge or you can do the whole thing with the gouge. Since I got this one in my hand let me sort of start it with that so you can see that. Just come over to the line and push it in. I'm a little short of the line. I move over. But as I say, this had leeway to it. It happens I got a little angle here, if you can see it, but that contributes because if you have an angle in a tenon, you want it to be an inclined angle rather than outward beveling. Outward beveling, it comes out of the chuck. And now I just need to get rid of some of this wood. This is not an area that the uh, wood is going to show. It'll all be removed later. So my only concern is a flat area right here by the tenon. Uh, because that's where the jaws will be. Square up the tenon. Your jaws are much stronger if you have a tenon that, uh, or a hole much better, if you have a tenon that does not bottom out 
but the top of the jaws is flat against the wood because it can't start moving in the jaws that way. So there we go with that. And all we need to do is turn that around. We won't need the uh, tailstock for a while. I'm not going to do it here because we're uh, trying to move along. But it's good to take the uh, live center out when the tailstock's still around and you're working. Uh, that way you don't attempt to install it in your elbow. We have a chuck here that's about ready for service and I believe it's got 50,000 miles worth of sawdust in it that needs removing. It's rather stiff. With all of these uh, scroll chucks, I think that's what they're called, it pays to uh, tighten both sides. You can even do this multiple times and it will uh, tend to move on the other side every single time. Uh, you don't want to let that wood get free. Now, I do not have a center point. And I don't know what would be true in any case. Now I have a center point and I'm certain it's in the center. So I need to lay on my roughly three inch uh, circle. So let's do that now. Take my elaborate jig, which is the same size as a mirror, and it looks like if I take out half to two thirds of the line, I will be about the right size for a mirror. So it's time to do that. We will make it round and uh, curve this front edge and all that stuff after we've got a mirror fit. That way if we screw up the mirror fit, Badly, we can either lower lower into the wood and do another, or give up and have less effort in it and start over. Again, with a parting tool, and I can use a little one or a big one. A big one gives me more room to get in with the uh, uh, gouge later, so let's try the big one. Now you can go whatever depth you like. I'm going a little extra depth here because I have to clean up the face. I'm leaving most of the line for fitting later. Uh, but I think the mirror looks good if it's not sunk in very far. And since I now am using a uh, block of wood uh, in this area to uh, hold a mirror, uh, to do the back or to hold a wood blank to do the back. I tend to make this shallow in the end. So it's deeper now than I will need it in the end. And then for the center here, I just need to get rid of some wood. I will go to the scraper after some wood stone to make it flat. Okay, there we are. Now I need to fit for the mirror, and I know I need to take... Okay, most of the line is remaining, so I'm going to take the gouge to work over near the line. Uh, no reason to be aggressive at this point. And then we will see if we're roughly the right size. A little tight, but it's probably time to go to the mirror to see what our fit is. I've got, uh, I don't recommend you do this just to get a prop, but I've got one here that's been dropped and it's cracked. It will not yet go, which I guess is better than having it too big. A parting tool, uh, a skew, a scraper, several tools could do this. It's just that I've got the uh, spindle gouge in my hand. 
there we go we got a fit uh, it's a little loose but I made some that were five inch one time and every one of them broke <coughs> when the wood dried so I'd rather have it a little loose than to have to rebuild somebody a mirror here I'm just taking some initial off before I check the bottom for flat this is just a square space face scraper you could use whatever I find this probably the easiest this is not my tool rest and it needs some work the scraper is not sliding very easily I don't know if you can see this but here in the metal I am low so I need to take some wood off everywhere else In flat work, uh, when hand planing, you cut what's touching to make what's not touching touch. And that's what we're trying to do here. This is close, would probably work, but between about a quarter inch in uh, down to the last half inch in the center, I probably need to take a skim cut off. So I don't want to start all the way at the outside, and I don't want to cut right in the middle. That is good. Uh, got a slight gap exactly in the middle, and that would be good if we used any other kind of sealant like silicon or liquid nails, because then if we got a little extra in there, it would squeeze to the middle rather than out. Now we need to get it round here and curve the face uh, if you're using thin piece of wood you would be nervous about pushing any chips off the back uh, we will pretend that in the, in this case but really this is way too thick so not a problem I'm also not worried here about taking too much wood off. If you make these bigger, the mirror is three inches. If you make these bigger in diameter than about three and five eighths, there is a definite danger of them not fitting in some of the bags that are available for sale. Uh, most all those bags are advertised as four inches but because the width from top to bottom of the mirror uh, you can't get four inches in one of those bags and I don't care about thickness here uh, I'm showing wood on the back uh, and this can be thin and it's way too deep now and the reason I'm not worried about that is I'm going to uh, put this, I'm going to double sticky tape this to hold it. I'm not going to expand the jaws. So I'm going to cut a bit of this face off and make a curve. And the face was not flat anyway, so that's just as well. Go into a curve here with the uh, thing, and I'm not worried about how good that curve is. I could worry about that and probably should but I've got scrapers right here and all I do is just start cutting at the front and cut all the way around and I'm not worried about back here at the rear because that wood's coming off when we do the back so I'm just worried about the front curve here And I call this a Don Riggs grind, but if you notice, the first half of this is almost flat, and the second half is dramatically curved. And I, of course, have the reverse on here, so if I wanted to do that, I can do uh, use it. I just got to make sure I don't dig in the point. And also, if you're traveling or something, you got two burrs twice as long before you sharpen. on bowls and what have you with that uh, square point you can't use both ends universally so 
check your finished product I know my curves okay I can see that going but what you're looking for particularly if it's cherry or some wood like that is a very white area or pull out here's some pull out and the transitions a bit white but as I say that's all going to be removed later so this looks okay and will require less sanding The, the plan was not to show you folks sanding, uh, so we paused the video, but I mentioned the white marks that are a problem to get out. Now these are back far enough I'm not going to get them out because they'll be cut away, but if you'll notice between the grain lines, uh, there is a definite white mark here between these two grain lines and there's one there. And those take considerable sanding. I don't know what to call them. I call it disturbed grain, uh, uh, bruised grain, whatever you like, but they got to come out. If you polish this surface, they will come back to haunt you. In this case, I don't have to remove them. I just want you to see them. But we're going to put a, a friction polish finish on just this front curve here. Uh, because we can't get back here once this is on the faceplate. So I'm uh, not bothering with the Renaissance wax for this uh, demonstration, but uh, the Renaissance wax is believed to be good uh, for keeping fingerprints off. And why wouldn't people handle a mirror? So normally you'd put it there. Uh, they call this friction polish for a reason, so I'm going to turn the lathe up quite a bit. I had it slow for sanding. And one of the problems, at least I think is a problem, is that's a tight notch here in the front, and how to get finish in it without finishing the entire inside, because I am going to uh, use tape to put the mirror in. So there I covered an inch, a quarter inch the inside, but I got finish uh, everywhere. Well, actually, this is the final abrasive. This is called Triple E. There's different kinds of this abrasive. And the Triple E is because there's three E's in here. There's also a Triple E that at least you use on the buffer that's spelled with a T. But as I say, uh, whatever the friction uh, polish is, or whatever the uh, abrasive part of the friction polish system you're using is, that's what you want to use. You'll notice that uh, Richard earlier used a different one. Now I've used this side for abrasive, and that is abrasive that's on there. So I want to use the other end or the other side for my finish. Now this finish, this one's called shallow wax. There's at least three other kinds that I'm aware of. Uh, will pull if you're not careful. And that's from drying too fast. And those lines will show up as if you didn't sand. Uh, one time when I didn't realize that I sanded one by about three times. Uh, and it wasn't the sanding. So there's, there's multiple solutions to this. You can put an additional thinner in, since this is mostly shit lack, I would use alcohol. Uh, you can uh, put uh, mineral oil or some kind of oil on your cloth, uh, which will lubricate and retard drying just a little. Or you can use very, very little. Today we're gonna try the very little approach and that's too much right off the bat but I can blot that into the fabric and have less uh, if you put on very little it's not uh, at least my theory is there's less to cause you a problem uh, with pulling now since we tried to use very little in this case it's probably not necessary because we didn't accomplish that you'd put a little on for a second time and if you can see that all I did was dampen the uh, napkin this is a paper towel actually it's a quarter sheet of a paper towel so I don't have so much in my hand I'm not trying to be overly frugal or anything but 
that is good now since I've got abrasive on the back side and I've used the finish on the other side I'm going to tear that much off again not frugal but I don't want to use that again but uh, when I go to the back okay it's time to turn this around All right, you'll recall earlier I was pointing out the white. Uh, this wood's going to be removed, but there's what happens when you put a finish on if you haven't sanded it away. Uh, so now I've, I've mounted my uh, block here to glue it in place, and I've got a piece of double sticky tape on there, not a large one. You won't be able to get it off when you're through. And to center it up, since that's a bit small, we will use the... Uh, live center eyelet that's already there and just push it together it'll true up or come close enough put a little pressure on it and uh, while the tape is setting better because it's pressure sensitive we will do all the shaping except for what's under the live center we will uh, start this with bowl gouge and perhaps do the whole thing with bowl gouge although we'll have to be careful here to to have a pleasant curve rather than a sharp point there's a low spot here and what I'll do in the beginning is not uh, cut there just skip over it and there's this is pretty shallow but sometimes uh, in the mirror mortise there's a low spot there and once upon a time uh, I managed to cut through one of those and wound up with no rim which uh, essentially means throw away I did that at the Virginia Symposium with a lot of people watching too This is a bit thick, and be careful here. If you go around there and get into the flat grain when you're curving that, you can lift splinters off the front, which will also destroy your uh, shape. So I'm gonna work less there, even though it's gonna come to a point, and then I'll use a scraper to round that point. And here all I'm done, trying to do is true up the cut a bit. This looks a little thick here, so I'm, I'm going to lower that a bit. Okay, let's hope our glue's set up now. I'm going to use a detailing gouge if for no other reason it's because I've got it laying out here and it's sharpened to take this uh, nub off. This is a real good time for light cuts. I tried at all these demonstrations, have at least one catch and that was it. Regardless of your lay speed, when you get down to the center, it is always going to be turning slower, so it's a good idea to slow your cut up there. I want to cut right through this center to have that out of the way. There you go, i got a high spot right here, but I've got to correct this anyway, so I will shear scrape it after I get this uh, point removed here. I don't know, some people might would like a point uh, that to have a sharp edge. I don't, and one of the problems with a sharp edge on any kind of a turning is when you pick up a dent or two from this being in a woman's purse or whatever, if a dent is on a sharp edge like that, you can see it from about 10 yards away. 
because it changes your uh, reflection. Now here we're going to try for a shear straight before we sand. Uh, we'll be nice to you guys and pause during sanding so you don't aren't bored to death. Got a high spot right here. I want to make sure I blend out. And with shear scraping, you can go either direction. I can go back over there. Keep your angle such that you don't uh, get that little vibration sound. That was uh, from the heel of my uh, bevel here uh, touching the wood and obviously it couldn't cut at that time so it bounced. That little ticky sound you heard. Okay, I like that shape well enough. It's time to uh, sand it and we'll be back. Okay, we're back. I lied to you. Uh, I was going to show no sanding, but I want to show you a trick. Uh, we're reversing the lathe for each grit. It's running backwards right now. But between your grits, particularly when you get down to finer grits, it's an excellent idea to dust off your piece. See how the color's changing? Uh, because that was last sanded with 320, and now I've removed the 320 grit and I'm using 400 and the 400 will be more effective and then stop the lathe you don't need to do this to your last grit but make sure that you can't find any lines if you do a quick with the grain will usually take care of it if you do that I don't see a reason to do this, I'm just showing it. Uh, sand two thirds or so with the grain from each side and then your overlap will take care of anything that you missed. Uh, brush that off again and we'll be ready to go to finish. We're ready to wrap this up by putting finish on. Uh, if you'll notice you can see grain here uh, but uh, since this is uh, darker and has a wax in it and the shallow wax that we used earlier also has an ambering uh, uh, in it uh, ambering agent uh, shellac uh, it'll pop that grain pretty nicely if we had all kinds of time this was furniture of course we'd go with the first coat being oil but it'll pop that grain out pretty nicely anyway uh, not enough speed get the speed up uh, they call this stuff friction polish for a reason. And this is essentially, our, as I explained earlier, our last abrasive. When it's too hot for you to hold it, you've done enough. And this is getting warm. So there's that step. I don't need to cut the lathe off, but I will. Turn it over where there's no abrasive. I got a little here, so don't take a chance. And now I'm going to go with the uh, finish. Uh, very, very light. Hopefully we'll get it right this time. That's plenty. So here we go with that. Uh, that was center out, but there's no good reason why it's got to be that way. I'm going to put what little I can around the front just in case, but the front is finished. All right, that's worked in very well and hot. Uh, burnish this, so you might want to change spots. Uh, paper towel's pretty cheap. I want about the same amount again. That, even though it's, it's spread out a bit, is probably two drops at the most. So I'm finishing the whole thing with like four drops. And the, all of the thinking there is uh, I don't want any pulling uh, from it drying too soon which will look just like I didn't sand it enough now we're not going to do it here but to keep down fingerprints it won't improve the gloss I generally uh, use Renaissance uh, wax but uh, 
you know watching wax go on is sort of like watching sanding we won't do it so all we got to do now is remove it this is pretty thin on the rim and the grains running through it this way so I want to go to the end grain so I don't pull a chip off now that I've got effort in this there it is removed tapes removed if you wanted to you could get a couple more of that piece of tape by just simply putting it back on your face plate there so here here's our finished piece uh, the uh, grain popped up pretty nicely it's nice and white I don't like the gray that you get in some uh, maple uh, this mirror glass would be taped in, but there it is, uh, finished mirror. Thank you.